Good evening, everybody. Welcome to a very stormy Briz Science for October 2018. I am your MC for this evening, Joel Gilmore, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to a very special multi-talented Briz Science tonight. We have not one but four speakers for you this evening, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, I'd like to start, though, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting tonight and to pay my respects to elders both past and present, and to acknowledge the efforts of those to promote and preserve Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures, which will create a lasting legacy for everybody into the future. Um, also, big shout out to The Edge, our wonderful venue partners here. Um, it's great to be back here, and uh, there's a, a new, an exciting new addition to the State Library, which we'll also be talking about tonight, so um, watch this space. And, of course, this talk is brought to you by the University of Queensland, who have supported Briz Science for about 11 years now. Um, so, great to see this keep running. And, of course, thank you to all you guys who are coming out. If this is your first time here, a very special welcome. Briz Science is the series of free public lectures on science held each month here in Brisbane. And uh, we're really excited to bring not just the best scientists, but also the best communicators and leaders in their respective fields of science and technology across Brisbane and Australia. A um, couple of bits of housekeeping. First of all, if you have your mobile phone, now is a great time to turn your ringer off and your Twitter on um, because we will be live tweeting throughout tonight, hashtag Briz Science, and you can follow the Briz Science account, UQ Briz Science account, um, for that live tweet stream. And we'll also be using Twitter to take questions throughout the night in addition to those question slips you picked up on the way in. So um, when you're inspired by something one of our speakers has said, write down your question and maybe the speaker's name or the number of the talk, just so that we can help to line that up later. And um, at the end of the talk, our wonderful team will come around and collect as many of those questions as we can, and, or we'll collect all the questions and we'll ask as many as we can before the time comes to go out for food and drink, which starts at the end of our talk. And we'd love you to join our speakers and all of the interesting people here tonight and have a chat and enjoy the social aspect of Briz Science, which is so important. Um, I think that's all of the housekeeping to get started. So tonight's talk is about the sharing economy. And this is something that we're probably all familiar with, whether it's through Airbnb or Uber, but new ways of connecting small producers and consumers of resources and goods across the world. And as befitting a talk about the sharing economy, we are, of course, sharing the stage tonight between four exceptional speakers, leaders in their respective areas and fields. And we will be um, hearing from them one after another and then we'll have a panel session at the end for a little bit more discussion and to take your questions. So our first speaker tonight is Deb Morrison, who is the founder and CEO of PetCloud, an Australian business very fast growing, which is a bit like Airbnb, but for pets, connecting uh, sitters, pet sitters and owners now with thousands across Australia. Um, the doggy reviews are a little harder to work, I understand, but... Um, and so she's going to talk about her experiences and introduce us to the sharing economy. But um, we're actually going to let Channel 9 Darwin do the introductions for us, um, who they can do it even better than I can. So please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Deb Morrison. If you love animals and making money, there's now a way you can combine the two. PetCloud is the country's first ever RSPCA approved pet sitting app and it's taking Darwin by storm. Dogs Stella and Sammy are already pretty good at sharing. So bringing another dog into the house was never a concern for mum, Kerry Ann. <laughs> we like the animals, so it's a bit of fun. They're some of Darwin's first pet cloud recruits. Think Airbnb for animals, an app that finds them a place to stay when you're away the first of its type in the country that's partnered with the RSPCA. Unfortunately, people think that just sending over somebody to feed them once or twice a day will help, but it's such a common reason for animals to get stressed or escape or end up in our care. On the site, sitters in Darwin offer their services from $5 to $50 a day, everything from daily walking to overnight stays at yours or the pet owner's house, even grooming or training. The 
Cookhouse. Eh? Who's Cookhouse? It's a pet lover's dream. Yeah, it's a good way to earn extra money. So, what's the catch? Anyone can sign up to Pet Club, but there are a few requirements. Your property needs to be fenced, and if you already have animals, they'll need to get on with their new borders. And for those who can house it... It allows you to have the joy of having a pet in your life if you can't take on the long-term commitment. Georgie Chumley, Nine News. Okay, so, um, yeah, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, so in terms of Pet Cloud, I absolutely love talking about Pet Cloud, so if I go over time, um, you'll have to let me know. Um, so I started Pet Cloud uh, when I had the challenge myself. Um, I was a pet owner. I had had an ex uh, a change in uh, living circumstance. And um, I was often required to fly interstate. Um, and I really couldn't find anyone to look after my pets. Um, it, uh, this was about six or seven years ago. And um, uh, at the time, I ended up finding a flyer in the street of a pet sitter. And I rang the service. And the number went to an answering machine. And um, I had to leave my name and number. And I'd get a call back after hours. So um, that was an unusual experience. And then uh, I got told that I'd be mailed an application form in the post and um, uh, I was to fill it out and then mail it back. <laughs> and then they would connect me with a pet sitter who I had no idea about, um, didn't know, you know what their skills and experience were like, um, and I didn't really know what questions to ask. Um, but uh, two weeks later, when I had my next work trip, um, I was connected with this mystery sitter. And at the time, because I had no other options, um, it was a little bit like, fingers crossed, dropping the dog off, hope it's going to be okay, <laughs> goodbye. Um, and I think a lot has changed because we're going from a whole cottage industry to now it's uh, accessible on the internet. Um, and the reason uh, why it had to go that way is because it, there was an education of pet owners that needed to occur, uh, and then also an education of pet sitters that needed to, to occur. And so we created this framework, um, along with the RSPCA, that enabled us to safely onboard the members of our community and keep out the ones that shouldn't be a part of our community. Um, so. Uh, at the time, uh, I was working for Virgin Australia, but I went home uh, one evening and um, I decided to create Pet Cloud. Um, I didn't know anyone who could build it for me uh, in IT, so um, uh, even though I worked with a ton of uh, people in IT, they all had their own projects on the side and after hours and busy families. So um, I went to freelancer.com and um, after one fellow went, so Freelancer is a, a contracting website typically with people in Europe or India or Asia and you can contact um, them at a very low rate to get a project done and, de and developed. Um, there's very uh, much differences in quality um, and sometimes there can be uh, language understanding difficulties um, but you just have to know how to communicate uh, with some of these people and, and take, take a lot of screenshots and explain things and do, do things, uh, like walk through uh, use cases and things like that. So, so I got the website built up into a prototype uh, into the point where it was transactional so people could actually hire out um, a pet sitter and um, a friend of mine uh, who was on my LinkedIn profile uh, actually saw me posting about Pet Cloud and he said, you need to meet up with RSPCA now. And I went, what do you mean? And he goes, mm, 
let's, let's have breakfast. And so I ended up meeting up with him for breakfast. And he said, oh, so tell me about what you're working on. And I told him about Pet Cloud. And he goes, look, I really can't tell you much more. You, you just need to go see them. And I was like, OK, all right. So uh, thinking that it's a good thing, thinking I'm not going to be prosecuted for anything. <laughs> um, so I turned up, and um, they were actually looking for um, uh, another, well, a, a version of that, and they had been talking with a, a European uh, platform um, at the time, but they were very attracted to the fact that um, I was based in Queensland and the team was based in Queensland, and um, it was all uh, transactional and functional, and we'd already had um, people joining the site, and they wanted the opportunity to work with us. So um, we ended up getting some seed funding from them, um, and so seed funding is basically um, an amount of money that an investor gives you um, to be able to grow your platform or your team. Um, and the reason why a charity was able to give us that money is because we um, help RSPCA with one of their objectives, which is uh, reducing the rate of animal abandonment at holiday time. So um, basically, every Easter, Christmas, September school holidays, what they used to end up with is a box of dogs or cats. And people would just go, ah, oh, moving house or going on holidays and just dump them off at their door because typically um, the spend at a kennel was about $70 a night per pet um, and it just wasn't affordable if you had a couple of pets um, and for people on a, a lower um, income, it just, it just wasn't affordable at all. Um, so we pretty much uh, got some funding off them uh, and then we... Uh, over time, met up with uh, Glenn Richards from Green Cross. Um, you might know Glenn from Shark Tank. Um, and we had a few meetings with him, and we got some more um, investment from Green Cross to help uh, grow our platform. But the key thing is with the sharing economy is it is a wonderful intermeshing of people from all different socioeconomic backgrounds. And this is really, really, really important to understand to everyone out there, is that you'll get your people with your high disposable incomes with not much time, people with much less uh, of a disposable income and willing to do uh, casual jobs. And people come from all different backgrounds, they have all different values, and you need a way of being able to uh, run a business and screen out these people. So in order for us to get our endorsement from the RSPCA, we had to do a roundtable workshop with their senior vets, their foster carers, their dog trainers, and their senior inspectors before they would endorse us. Plus, we had to do an online uh, pet care course for our sitters, and every single sitter has to do that online course to understand the standards of the care that the RSPCA expects. Um, and as well as that, every sitter also gets a police check. Um, originally, when um, I, uh, we partnered with the RSPCA, uh, I was uh, a little bit naive, uh, but I was grateful um, and I was proud, but I really didn't understand the value of the relationship. Um, and what they did was just through education and talks and um, just over time, they've really opened our eyes as to the type of people that are out there. Um, there have been so many people <laughs> that there is a, a great side to the sharing economy, don't get me wrong. We have um, so many terrific carers and sitters um, and so many great pet owners, but there are also people out there who will lie to your face <laughs> and so, at, you know, um, will lie about their name, um, will have the guts enough to apply for a police check and hope that you won't check the results. Um, we've had a, a, a woman who applied for a pet taxi service. She wanted to use her car to um, offer a pet taxi service through us. And I said, great, you can give us your uh, driver's license and, a, um, and we need to do a police check on you. And you also need to upload a clear profile photo. 
well, she wanted to upload a profile photo like this. And, and then, of course, I uh, only wanted to upload the back of the driver's license and, like, all these things. Anyway, so we did a police check on her, found out that she had uh, run red lights, been caught with petty theft, lying to police and drink driving. And, uh, of course, she didn't get anywhere near our platform. And at the time, I'll let you know that other competitors in the sharing economy were letting... Uh, pet sitters from their website without any police checks into the homes of pet owners while they're away. And it, there has to be a lot of ethics involved, good integrity involved in sharing economy businesses because there is a lot of pressure from investors out there to give me that traction, give me that customer growth, give me that return on my investment. And that, at the same time, places pressure on entrepreneurs to do tactics or skip um, checks and verifications and processes that really are important to have in place. And so at the time, uh, when I was hearing about this, I just said, I don't care, not on my watch. I'm going to sleep well at night. I don't care, because sooner or later, something's going to happen. And sure enough, something has happened uh, to their site. Uh, and I just think, in terms of the sharing economy, you really need to get involved with industry advisors, the council and the police to um, ensure that all these checks, all these identity checks uh, are taking place. And if you see uh, badges of verifications, ask what actual verification, when, when did it last take place? Because you won't always get... Uh, People like myself or the RSPCA involved. There's a lot of sharing economy businesses out there um, and you just have to be vigilant. So there's a great, great side of joining up. Some of our, um, some of our best pest sitters on the website are seniors and retirees um, because they have the time, they're reliable, they have a backyard to spare and they, uh, they take their time and they're careful with, and they care about pets. And that's what we want. Um, but, yeah, you just, uh, I think there's, there's good and bad sides to the sharing economy, so you've just got to be mindful of that. <laughs> um, was there anything else that you wanted me to cover in terms of... Okay. All right. Well, thanks very much, guys, for your time. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Deb. Our next speaker is one of Australia's most prominent marketers and a regular international keynote speaker, frequently on television and in print. And in particular, he is the co-founder and managing director of Curb, a global peer-to-peer -peer parking app. So could you please welcome our next speaker, Rob Brown. Okay, good evening, everyone. <clears throat> I'm going to cover three key areas tonight in 10 minutes, whiz through a whole bunch of slides. Um, why try and solve the global parking problem um, with a peer-to-peer -peer, you know, sharing economy model? Now, let's talk about what, what is Curb, okay, um, and who is it helping? And then finally, to the theme of tonight around the sharing economy, how can sharing economy platforms like Curb help cities um, like Brisbane and other cities around the world of similar size and bigger? Okay, so why? So we can all relate to this problem. Um, the commute to work. Every single person in the room can relate to this. Um, you've got the first mile, then you've got the traffic, and then you've got the last mile. The last mile, where do you park? Okay, those of you who are lucky enough to have your own space at work um, are very privileged. But so many of us have to pay early, day, early bird parking, in before 8, out after 6, um, or you get stung for... 85, 95, 98 dollars, sorry, 89 dollars for three hours plus in Sydney, uh, where I live. Um, it's, we are one of the most expensive countries in the wor world for parking, but this is not just an Australia problem, it's a global problem. Um, so parking's last mile comes with a huge cost across the developing world and the developed world. Um, traffic, time, dollars, cost, you know, fines, just how much you pay in fines every year. Productivity loss from arriving at work, you know, at 9.15 rather than at 8.15, and then the impact on the environment. 
So there are a lot of problems here to solve. And there are alternatives um, to getting cars out of the city. There are car sharing programs, etc. But, you know, these, you know, with this talk about flying vehicles, about autonomous cars, Google's been trying to solve this problem for 12 years and has still not got cars, mainstream cars on the road. This is a really complex problem to solve. So it's not going to get solved. People who talk about everyone driving Ubers in the next five years, uh, self-driving Ubers or Google, Google cars, it's not going to happen within that time frame. As soon as you get humans and robots navigating the same carriageway, you're going to have problems, okay? Humans cross at red lights, they text, they've got kids in the back, they're distracted, they drive under the influence of all sorts of things. It's not going to work unless you've got separate carriageways which are prohibitively expensive. So parking remains a huge problem to solve. So what is Curb? It's the Airbnb of car parks, homeowners cashing in on empty spaces. Yeah. But now a new scheme is gathering momentum which makes parking cheaper for patients and visitors whilst also freeing up valuable spaces in the car parks. Right. So Curb is a new program which allows anyone to rent out spare space for as little as $5 a day. Curb is the Airbnb of car parking and people. But Curb is one of them and offers kind of a, an Airbnb and an Uber model parking. Let's find out more. Rob Brown is Managing Director of Curb and joins us. Curb, I see what you did there. Curb side, very clever. So he's a nutter, that guy. Do you know him? The, 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 anyway, anyway. Yeah. Aussie guy. So what is Curb? So we've got two models. We've got an Airbnb model to coin a cliche, which is I've got a parking space under my garage, you know, under my building or in my yard or in my garage where you could park a vehicle. Could be a car, it could be a motorbike, could be a boat. We've, we've got more and more boats coming onto the platform. But we've also got another model which is tapping into car parks, okay? So if you think about your local church um, down the road, uh, their car park is empty six and a half days a week. And the the, the half day, it's busy. The other six and a half days, they spend the time trying to shoo the public out of it. Um, but the same goes for schools. You know, those of you parents who are trying to find a park around a soccer game on a Saturday or hotels between 9.30 in the morning and 5 in the evening, hotel car parks are empty. Very often, they are located next, near to, near, next to transport hubs or, you know, the central business district. They could be used by other people. And every time you drive out of your parking space in the, in the morning, somebody else could be using that. So that's what Curb is. Um, we have lots of different types of uners, users, but typically homeowners, you know, I've got a uh, secure parking spot, I'm not using it, somebody, it's next to RBWH, somebody else could be using it. Um, business guys, you know, commuters, they're paying a, a fortune for early bird. Um, very, very common use case for us, and then property managers, you know? Might be the state library, it might be the museum, it might be a, you know, a condominium. All around the world, we're seeing this kind of people saying, help me manage my, you know, help me get better, better usage out of my parking spaces. So churches are one example, schools, you know, as I say, um, hotels, and then apartment blocks. So visitor parking, for example, a nightmare for property users. Uh, property managers, um, we solve that problem with free parking. You don't even need to pay for it. You just use Curb app to manage your apartment uh, as visitor parking. So how are sharing economy models like Curb, like Uber, like Airbnb, how are they helping cities around the world? Okay. Um, there is a, there's a, this, this sharing economy, there's a, there's a major factor that is, that is, um, that has changed in the last 10 years, 15 years, particularly since Airbnb and, and Uber came along, but this was happening before. And this is the, the, the trust, we don't trust institutions anymore, okay? Look at what happened with Brexit in the UK, you know? People will trust the bus driver, they'll trust the, the opinion of the taxi driver over the opinion of a politician or economist. We don't trust any more institutions, the banks, the, you know? Um, so institutional trust is, has been massively compromised over the last sort of, you know, few decades. And peer trust, peer-to-peer -peer trust, we trust each other. We're much more likely to trust somebody in this room than we are to trust the bank or the insurance company or the real estate agent, um, you know, and those kind of institutions. So the sharing economy, I need something and you have it, okay? So if, if there's efficiency and there's trust there, the platform, that two-sided marketplace, has got every chance of working. So I need someone to work, somewhere to ride with, 
someone, you know, some tasks to be done at home. I need superior experiences when I'm traveling. I need flexibility to work wherever I want, and I need convenient parking. Those are just six examples. There are many. Um, so in this world, you've got WeWork, you've got Uber, you've got TaskRabbit, AirTasker, Airbnb, um, Upwork for that freelance work, and then Curb for parking. So this is the new world of the sharing economy that we are all. Who came here tonight in an Uber? Anybody? Yeah. Okay, a few hands. Who stayed in Airbnb before? Who, any, any Airbnb hosts? Yeah. Okay, has anybody used Upwork? No? Okay. So, our cities, which was one of the key themes tonight, our cities are changing, okay? They're changing, you know, radically. Um, technology now lets us work from anywhere. I was saying to somebody before this session tonight that in 30 years time, even 20 years time, maybe even 15 years time, we'll look back and say, do you remember the time when you had to travel in the city and work in front of a computer in a building from 9 o'clock till 6 o'clock in the evening? Do you remember we used to have to do that? That's how absurd that when I came back to Australia in 1995, having lived in Europe, Paris, and the UK for 20 odd years, the place you went to get information was a library, was a building, okay, with books in it. That was only 22 years ago. So the nature of work is changing fundamentally. Co-working and innovation hubs are now everywhere. There's one in this building, there's one in the building down the road, River City Labs, they're everywhere. And it's not just in Australia, they're all around the world. Pedestrian areas are being reclaimed, okay? So, you know, you're seeing this again in cities like Paris, cities like Sydney at the moment. They're, you know, they're digging up the, what, two, some of the main arteries to reclaim that space for pedestrians. Um, green spaces are being established. Government efforts to get vehicles out of the city. You're seeing that across the developed world. Um, slightly different story in the developing world, but you're still seeing efforts at a government level. And then the notion of ownership is changing fundamentally. The notion of owning a car that sits empty 23 hours a day is becoming slightly absurd. But it wasn't when, certainly wasn't when I got my first driving license. You know, it was like you had to have a car. It was a rite of passage. So our cities are changing. And so is the way we travel into them and out of them. So congestion is a crunch point. We can't take any more cars, most cities in the world. So we're coming in with ride-sharing apps like, like, like Uber, electric scooters, the amount of um, venture capital pouring into this space at the moment is eye-popping. Bike-sharing and then personal well-being. We all know somebody who walks or runs into work, no matter how many kilometers they have to travel. So citizens are seeking a more meaningful experience. Okay? And this is one of the things that is fueling the sharing economy. When you think about it, this why is this change? We just had a 250-year interruption to the normal way of how business and communication was always done. This is the Industrial Revolution, okay? Spinning Jenny, the steam engine, 1764 in the UK. We all know the history, or most of us do. Okay? That led to factories being built on the outskirts of the cities. Okay? And that's where the work was, so that's where the people, the village, the sort of the, the marketplace, which was the center of town, that died. Okay? And we all went to work in factories. It resulted in this, and then this, and then in the last century, we had this, and then we had this. Okay? We can all relate to that. We're all, we were all alive in this time. Cities have reached a tipping point. Everywhere in the world, we are seeing this. Okay? And people are searching for a more meaningful existence. Yoga is not some little Indian fad. This is a global phenomenon, okay? It is a global phenomenon. The candle industry, why a candle? The candle industry in the US alone is a $4 billion industry, why? Go figure, you've got electricity everywhere. What do you need candles for, okay? This is what people are searching for. So final thoughts, okay? Maslow's hierarchy of, of uh, human needs, we all know this, every marketing presentation has got this, this pyramid in it, okay? Starts with the basic needs, food, water, shelter, security, friends, etc. There's a, there's a, a new adap uh, adaptation that's been added to this, that Wi-Fi is the most important, but there's one other which is battery, okay? But the, the, the thing that I'm focusing on this, and this is, the, this is where the sharing economy really kicks in, it's this top piece. 
People have got more than they ever had before, but they feel less fulfilled, less satisfied than ever before. You've got five cars, you've got six TVs, but they're not happy. What's going on? Okay, um, sorry. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Press the back button. So people, Maya Angelou said, people will forget what you said, they'll forget what you did, but they will never forget the way you made them feel. Who's been in a taxi recently? You never get this in a taxi. You get this in every single Uber. There's water, there's Wi-Fi, and there's a guy or a girl who knows your name, and you know that person's name. It's, they've just raised the bar slightly on the taxi experience, but it's night and day, as anybody who knows what a taxi is at. Anybody who stayed in an Airbnb and there's a bottle of wine and a little personalized note, you do not get that in a hotel, ever. This is Curb. This is just one of our listings, okay? This is parking. It's not the sexiest industry. Ashray, vacant driveway close to road. Arrive between 7 and 8 and I'll make you a takeaway coffee. You don't get that at your local Wilson or your secure parking. That parking space is $2 a day, okay? $2 a day. So, Victor Hugo said, nothing is as powerful as an idea whose time has come. And I would posit to everybody in the, in, in the room today, that the sharing economy has only just begun. And we're going to see it impact government, we're going to see it impact enterprise, the Uber for, the Airbnb for this and that, that's kind of been done. The real impact of the sharing economy is we're going to see in the next five to ten years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rob. Our next speaker has 27 years experience in coaching leaders of business and industry and has a background in psychology. Currently, she is the CEO of Optimization Hub, which helps athletes perform at their best. So please join me in welcoming our next speaker, Graziella Fake. Rob, that was a fantastic act to follow, I've got to say. So, hi ladies and gentlemen, my name is Graziella, my name is Italian Maltese and I was born in Mumbai and I carry an Australian passport and I'm the original sharing economy. So, essentially as I stand before you, I have had 27 years experience in helping and leading businesses. Recently, I've however become very involved in not only understanding what was happening with business, which I started to do 20 years ago when someone handed me a telephone, but it was in a box. Do you remember that? You got a telephone in a box? I looked at it and I said, what on earth is this? And they looked at me and they said, it's a phone. It's going to go with you everywhere. And I looked at them and I said, but there's no phone. No, open the box. Well, everybody's got something they carry in their palm of their hands now. Who hasn't got a phone in this room? You haven't? I'll bring you one. <laughs> Having a phone seems to be the optimal. I have an eight-year-old who knows how to use a phone better than I do. On a phone, there are apps a way to connect. Essentially, the psychology of buying has changed the way that we connect. Consumerism took over, and as Rob has led us into, consumerism is why the sharing economy exists. So, as we go forward, I put up here just a few basic things. How I'm coming at the sharing economy with you today is not just the optimization hub and the business that I've invested in and why I've invested in it and what I'm doing with it, but also what I've been doing with business over the last 15 years to help them to understand how to build trust in the sharing economy. Who trusts the sharing economy? Who trusts it? Very few people in this room. We've got about five hands in this room. Who knows how to trust it? Okay, let me demystify a little bit for you. The sharing economy is essentially just you and I in a room connecting. It's connecting through a platform, a way that we work. Everyone's looking at IT saying, wow, this is a great thing that's taken over. iPhones, phones, any kind of Android phone, a way to connect is going to help you to understand the world around you. What we have is how do we trust what's at the other end of that? We've seen a couple of examples. So in our first example we got today was, here was a person saying, well, I'd like to come and offer my services to you, but I'm not legal to do so. I'm going to let you into my home, but I've got convictions. I'm going to take your pet places, but I've actually had parking offences. So there are small examples like that, but there are bigger examples of being duped in that economy. So what we want to know is how to trust. And if a business is going to build some trust, it has to learn how to work. 
We know all of these symbols, and most of us know that symbols come up, and these are symbols of the sharing economy. In the sharing economy, we have Airbnb, and as Rob's already reiterated, and I'm not going to go through because he's covered some of the topic area there, around the number of ways that we share. We can get on a bike, we can share commodities. Why we share commodities now is because consumerism has led us down the track of thinking that we need to own everything. Now, in my particular business and what I've invested in is I've invested in training. Training people how to trust, how to have great mental health. How on earth do I sell that as a widget or a gadget? Well, I had to learn and I had to teach people how to trust the platform we were putting up. And the way we did that was to think about, we've got to change the ownership, the model of sitting in front of someone and trusting that person in front of you when you go and you purchase something or you're part of something. How do we get them to trust what we're doing online? And we had a really interesting conversation in here about how platforms and these magnificent platforms you've just seen have been established. How do you think they've been established? In one moment, do you think the moment a platform goes up, everybody starts using it? No. It's like you and I, you've got to trust me, I've got to trust you. It takes work, so the entrepreneurs that go and build a platform and how the building of a shared economy has worked, it's worked through the building basis of hard work and hard yards to go out there and understand how consumers want to be spoken to, what the need is, where is it hurting and why and how can I solve the issue. I've got a parking problem, let me give you free parking. Let's exchange something through the exchange of whatever money or whether it's a service so that you and I can share what's out there. The IT platform is the sharing economy we're talking about, but it's a vehicle for the sharing economy to happen. So basically the sharing economy itself is a way for us to connect and to use services. Why am I telling you this? Because in order for you to trust me and to me to trust you, or you to trust the sharing economy, and all of you have unanimously said, if I look around the room, 97% of you had your hands down, you didn't trust it. To trust it, you have to understand that the sharing economy is merely a way or a vehicle to use a platform. For you and I to connect, for you to find out about me someplace, and to learn about what that background's all about, and then to go out and experiment with that utilization. It's basically a village. We're kind of doing a 360. We came from learning, and this is as a psychologist, what fascinates me, is we came from connecting in a village system where we had our own, I'll give you this loaf of bread for that bag of fish, and now we've come back to it, and that's what the sharing economy is all about. It's about saying there's a mutual exchange going on, and I'm able to use this service because you have it for free, and I can exchange it. How do I trust that service? How do I know that it's there? Why is it that I don't trust certain services? Why I don't trust certain services is because I know in society it's like putting everybody onto a boat at sea. You're going to have everybody there and 1% to 2% of those people are going to be trying to dupe you. So not everybody in the sharing economy is trying to dupe you. They're trying to provide services. You'll get one person out of 500 that might be dishonest about what they're doing. How to know and how to use it is to understand that there are definitions of why this is existing and why it's occurring. Behind the sharing economy, there's one need, and that is we need to connect with each other. We need to be able to connect with a service and trust it. We also need to be saving ourselves time and money. Who wants to save time and money in this room? Hands up. Time and money. Who wants to connect with other people? Yep. Who wants to be able to trust what they're using? Okay. To do all of this, what we've got to be able to do is to compare. And comparing and competition and consumerism can happen so easily online in a sharing economy. So therefore, what a sharing economy means is everybody joining into one idea and saying, I need that service and I can find out about it. We like to source information and we also like to not compete. So in countries like Korea, where competition and consumerism took over, what was happening was mental health was becoming poor. Why we came around with this, why we looked at this in our own business, was we were concerned with multiple users getting onto our platform and we knew that there were social, economic, practical and sustainable solutions that were needed so that we could ensure that the education we were offering was being offered in a short, succinct way. Because online users or connecting online only grabs people's attention for about 10 seconds. I've got to be able to get that interest straight away. So to do that, I have to make sure that I'm part of something and I can connect into other things. Pets, parking spaces, they're commodities that you can 
work around and use and purchase in different ways. Mental health is slightly different. So for us, our journey was kind of interesting. We had to understand, here we go, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which has already been flashed up there. So we needed to know, well, how would our users interact with us? And we wanted to understand at the optimization hub because we targeted a problem. Here we see 73% of our young athletes coming out of sport with mental health issues. And we said, well, why? Sport's meant to be healthy. 5.2 million Australians are engaged in sport. Why is it that we're having 73% of them coming out of that with a negative experience? Why are our young people experiencing mental health issues at early stages of their lives? So we looked at using the platform from both a physiological perspective, they had to be able to interact with us as people, so we went out there to prove the product. Then we had to establish safety of the product itself. And by doing that, we went out and created what was called a minimum viable product or an MVP. So we had to ensure that our platform was utilisable. And then we had to link into other components of the sharing economy to establish trust in networks that already existed. And that's what the sharing economy did for us as a business. And that's where we invested and we put our money behind it. Then we had to build up for our users a social connectivity. So in our platform, we made sure that we were able to connect with everybody and we were connecting them to other viable products that they could use in the marketplace, as well as people and athletes internationally. Our platform has now started to grow and it started to build identities of people and we've tapped into that identity. So good old Maslow's hierarchy of need is all, needs is also how you can build trust. And the way for you to build trust in using platforms out there is to ensure that you can trust them, that you know that they're connecting you and that you ensure you feel safe with them. These are the checklists. And as much, as much as I'd highlight it, you highlight that checklist for yourself as you go out there and you start to use platforms around education. Contributing to smarter cities through the utilisation of platforms is something that's existing now. It's right here and now. It happens everywhere and all around us. And for us to be part of it or to not be part of it is our own personal choice. But in order for us to be smarter, we have to be able to be viable. So to be viable, we need to be able to start sharing our commodities and also learning to trust what's there. To do this, we want to experience and relate to things. So to be able to form a relationship to a platform is something really important for me and also for you as a user to come to. Key questions. What's a key question you ask when you go out to maybe use a platform or to use a sharing economy experience? Give me a key question. Am I going to get ripped off? Why is it number one? What's your key question? <laughs> Do you got a question? Who's got a question that they would ask? Yep. Can you communicate on the way that um, you like Amazon and where you have reviews from past users? Okay, so am I going to get ripped off and are there any past user reviews? Those are really important questions. And these are the things that the sharing economy is now getting a little bit more of a with. There are reviews going up. You need to check these things. Am I going to get ripped off? Find out. Look behind it. Google and find out. So Google's our way of finding out and going through that portal into who's doing what, where have they been, how are they utilising things. There's a quick answer from a social and economic perspective that we can't really say that the sharing economy is a place we're going to get ripped off because it's actually just a segment of society. You could walk out that door and somebody could rip you off on a parking space or someone could rip you off around the corner. The sharing economy is merely a segment of society the way it exists. So it's not a place that breeds distrust. We can trust it. But you know what? It's really transparent. If you want to check something out, you can go and check it out on that economy. And the reason is that you can see everything in a transparent way. So I'm, I've asked for our, our website and our YouTube videos not to show them up here because there's a bit of in-depth stuff there, but they can go out and, and be tweeted out. In terms of focus groups and video content, that's where we went to to build our own website and our hub and how we connected to other users in the sharing economy. The key for us was also to make sure that we use the psychology of that economy and we were able to look at the reviews and experiences of other users in that economy before we built our platform. 
So when you look at platforms and you see the build and you see what's there, usually it's taken around about a year to a year and a half of testing to get it there. And so when you ask the question, can I trust this? Look at the history of those that have founded and built it. And then also look at the user history. How have users been interacting with those products, both offline and offline and online if you can? How have they interacted with what's gone before? A service has to say something to be meaningful to people, so ensure that it's meaningful to you and ensure that you can use that service. And in finishing off, because I know that it's the last thing and I've got to hurry up because I can see him over there, is get out there and get sharing. So I've come at you from a slightly different perspective to say educate yourselves in the sharing economy, realise that it's really just using a platform, a platform as a vehicle. IT isn't what the sharing economy is. It is just a village system, a way to connect with people. So if you're going to go out there and connect and educate yourselves, start doing so by doing the user reviews, understanding what you want, knowing that it appeals to your need, knowing that it's going to save you time and be able to socially connect with other people. And make sure you make it work for you. Thank you so much. Our last speaker tonight is a PhD candidate at the University of Queensland and someone who's been passionate about working towards environmental sustainability for more than a decade. She is also the founder of the Brisbane Tool Library that has just recently moved downstairs in this very building. So, um, Sure, you'll find out more about that in a moment, but here to explain how the sharing economy could be the solution to all of our social and ecological crises, please welcome Sabrina Chakori. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me to speak here today, and thanks for coming and sharing this moment. Um, I will start briefly talking about myself because I feel that it's important to understand people's stories and how we got to start what we actually are doing now. So I spent the last 11 years fighting for the environmental cause. I'm 26, so almost half of my life. I, um, I worked toward uh, the protection of the Amazon forest against plastic, uh, plastic bags reduction, so many campaigns. But I arrived in a moment in my life where I couldn't focus just on one single issue because of lack of time and energy. So I had to step back and realize that all these issues were equally important to me and I had to understand how they were interlinked. I came to the conclusion that the social and environmental challenges that we are facing today are uh, connected to our current economic system. When we think about waste, that's probably what crossed our minds. From 1997 to 2012 in Australia, we had an increase of waste by 145%. But population increased just by 22%. So we can definitely see that waste is increasing, but what we can't see there is that consumption is increasing as well. Yes, we are living in a hungry economic system that focuses on increasing the economy, increasing GDP, and this is the result. It's important to frame how we got to this situation. As Elizabeth Cohen uh, from the Harvard University outlined, uh, our consumptive habits grow out of post-World War II, where the population were um, invited to spend to consume because after the war, we had to rebuild economic growth. Since then, we kept consuming phones, computers, clothes, cars, and so on. Consumption, it's an important and fundamental relationship, connection between human and nature. But because of our uh, economic growth imperative, it's often ignored. We do talk about population growth and the effects, the ecological effects of population growth, but nowhere in the media or in political agendas we talk about economic growth as a problem. However, as Ivanova and team in 2016 showed, household consumption alone 
uh, produces and it's responsible for 60% of greenhouse gases emission and up to 80% of planet resources. What does it mean? It means that we are using all of our planet resources just to produce and consume goods to feed our economic system. And that's where the sharing economy plays an important role. For me, a sharing economy is simply defined as the sharing of unused or underutilized assets. With a real sharing economy, we can build a collaborative consumption where we can buy less things and still have access and build our own prosperity. Who has some of these tools? Who has a drill in here? Yeah, a few. Did you use it yesterday? Who used it yesterday? Yeah, one person? That's not too bad. So we all have at home one or, or more of these items. But if we take a drill, for example, it's used on average just three hours max per year, when the potential use of it is 20 hours. Some other statistics shows that a drill might be used just for 12 minutes over the life cycle of it. And it's not waste, it's just there somewhere gathering dust at our place. And that's what brought me to practically respond to these challenges, creating the Brisbane Tool Library. As the name says it, it works as a book library, but instead of books, people can borrow hand and power tools, camping gear, kitchen appliances, party appliances, and much more. The tool library movement is growing around the world with many tool libraries in the US and in Canada. What we are working towards, we want to move from a linear economy where we make, we use, and we dispose, we throw away, to where the circular economy, a sharing economy, which means that items go from start to start. And our objectives are to reduce consumption and by consequence waste while prioritizing access over ownership. How we are doing it? Very simple. So we are a not-for-profit organization. We collect tools and various items from the communities and local businesses. With our team, we clean them, we test and tag them, and then they go up on our software in our inventory that you can browse online. As you can see, we also have Christmas decoration. Being a member of the tool library, you can change your Christmas tree every year. <laughs> People can just type in the name of what they need, and the software is going to show you what we have in stock. All the tools you're seeing in there, they're second hand and they've been cleaned at the same time. Our members, so we have membership schemes which are very low because we want to give access also to low income people. Our members become members of the tool library to save money. For the price of one tool, you can have access to 100 of them to save space because we stock just too many things at home. And finally, they can reduce their footprint. But most importantly, beyond lending and borrowing, with the tool library, we created a community around us. We organized workshops, events, you can see our team in there. And there is a need to redesign the economy. And we see it every day with people coming in and visiting us. And uh, as it has been mentioned before, the Brisbane Tool Library is now located in this building at level zero. And thanks to a partnership signed with the State Library of Queensland, we're the first tool library in Australia, and we believe in the world, to be part of a public library. This means that while sharing economy is a new term, libraries have been around forever. And now they can extend their services to the community, uh, going beyond just lending out books. Being a member of a tool library, you can impact the economy. You can impact the market. You, together, we can not only prolong the use phase of the item, but we can choose to favor items with a longer dura durability, and we can fight plant obsolescence, which is all what feeds our market. How we can do this? Well, we need structural changes, which means we need to redesign our cities and our infrastructures ar around this sharing project in order for them to flourish. We need institutional drivers. We need to change our political and economic frameworks, shifting from economic growth and increasing GDP to a new economy. Finally, we need cultural drivers. How can we work on this? Well, it's all depend on what we eat and drink, how we go around, how we go around 
and what we choose to buy or not to buy. Finally, I really like this quote. We don't really need a drill, we just need a hole in the wall. <laughs> and <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, here we live in a, a planet with limited resources. We can't change our planet, but we can change our economy. Thank you. <laughs>Thanks so much, Bruno. Um, I'll invite all our panellists now to come up onto stage, perhaps have yourself a glass of water. Meanwhile, if you have questions, they've already been coming in thick and fast on Twitter, but write yours down, wave them in the air. Leone and Dom will come around and collect those from you now. And next month, next month, Riz Science is, of course, back, and we have the fantastic Sam Hinton who is an award-winning astrophysicist, and he is going to be talking about dark, the dark side of the universe, cosmic mysteries and their histories. Um, you might also know Sam from the Australian Survivor, the last season of Survivor. Um, I won't spoil whether he survived, but um, if you want to know more, you'll have to come next month. Okay. You guys ready for some questions? Fantastic. All right. So um, we have a few questions around um, trust and regulations and so forth. So I'm going to ask and paraphrase a couple of those. Um, so the first one is from David on Twitter who asks, trust is an important part of human interaction. Does the sharing economy break this trust by dancing around established rules and regulations designed to protect consumers? Well, I feel that a lot of sharing economy projects are peer-to-peer, -peer, but that's new. it's not the only way to implement a sharing economy. And we are the example in a different way, that we are an institution and people have to walk in a building. So that is another way of building a sharing economy and still have that a normal cultural way of sharing resources. <laughs> Anyone else want to add anything to that? I think it just, it just even saying that, you know, sharing economy, because we keep using these words, the sharing economy, and I kind of come at it from a linguistic sense of, you know, it's a platform, and a platform is a way to interact. It's like we've come into a room, we're interacting this way. So a multi-user experience is simply a way for us to walk into a room. So when we created our platform, we designed it with a series of rooms, and who would walk in through which room, and what did they need when they walked in? So I'm not quite sure that we break lots of rules in, on, in an online mechanism. It's just that it seems less trustworthy because you're not physically in front of somebody. So doing those checks is really important. I think, I think different um, sharing economy platforms have implemented trust to varying degrees. Some have done it to a small extent and some have done it to a large extent and um, uh, some have digital badge systems for trust to tell you what verification checks have been done. Um, and uh, I think some sharing economy platforms work with regulations um, and not everyone um, understands some of those regulations or realises those regulations are even out there um, and I think particularly what uh, our business does as well is um, make sitters aware of, of what is out there in terms of regulations with regards to, you know, Domestic Animals um, Act and uh, the five freedoms of the RSPCA and things like that. Um, but, yeah, it just depends because there is no one, there's no set standard across... Um, all different sharing economy businesses um, with regards to verification checks. So you've just got to do your own homework. Um, and perhaps a follow-up question, which is perhaps on the legal side, from Philip, who asks, how quickly or slowly is the legal system adapting to the sharing economy and digital disruption, in particular things like council bylaws for accommodation or transport laws for Uber? So, uh, as I showed, there are many tool libraries in the world, and no one ever started one in Queensland, which was exciting. Then, then I understood why, <laughs> because regulation in Queensland are much different than the US and 
uh, in other continents. But I feel uh, having regulation as an obstacle is very limiting for just our human evolution. Regulation, they have to adapt to needs. And, and it took us our time and we are still in a gray area, but regulation just gonna follow up as they did with Airbnb and other uh, things. So definitely if you are inspired by starting something, regulation are kind of made to you know, pass through and navigate and change with uh, community needs and resilience. <laughs> Yeah, resilience is important. Um, I think, you know, regulations exist and I think the legal system has caught up in different ways. For us, it was intellectual property and it was ways to migrate our system and keep people's information safe when they're interacting with our platform. And certainly, I mean, we partnered with Dentons in the very early stages of the development of our platform because we wanted to be partnered with an international legal firm that understood international legal regulations and would keep our consumers safe. So in the construction of our platform, we consulted and we abided by regulations because it was important to us that we had something that wasn't here for five minutes, it was here for the long term. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of a lot of the politicians that you you know commentate on this stuff are, are simply they're just not familiar with the platforms. Uh, we had the the Lord Mayor of Brisbane last last week on two weeks ago on Channel Seven um, from a completely uninformed position, uh, saying that that the, the you know renting out your your garage or your private driveway was illegal, and it's it's clearly not. There's 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 legislation to say that it is legal, but that legislation hasn't been updated for years and years and years. I mean, you know, they're quoting transport acts from the mid 90s that were sort of written before the advent of the sharing economy. And I think, you know, in their defense, they're, they're, they're struggling to catch up. And this is, we've, we've seen the fights in law courts that Airbnb and Uber have, have had around the world. Um, and obviously you've got the taxi and the hotel industries sort of lobbying as well. Um, but I think it is difficult for, for governments because they're, it, it's not easy to suddenly change a law overnight. Um, and, uh, and a lot of the people who are writing these laws just don't, uh, are out of touch with what's going on at the grassroots level in their cities. Can I just add one thing? Just because we mention a lot of big brands and one of them is Uber. And I really don't think Uber is a sharing economy platform anymore. The idea was that sharing cars going from point A to point B and co share it with someone else. Well, sharing economy became a branch of simply the capitalistic system where you call a Uber to come to point A to go to point B, which is basically a different taxi service but without uh, worker rights and labor rights and everything. So it's the sharing economy is a bit everything and nothing, really. So I just put it on it. <laughs> Francisco has a system of, um, which is, I think, a fantastic example of a sharing economy. If you're sharing rides to work, you get free parking as a reward for it. You know, and, and that's a true sharing economy system where there isn't really a financial transaction. It's, hey, look, let's just share a ride together. We get a free car park. Right. Um, question here. For those who started their own business, what was the most challenging part of setting that up? I think we've addressed some of those, but I'll ask it just in case you have any other horror stories you'd like to. Well, for us, the challenge is being a not-for-profit organization. So we, as not-for-profit, we can't have investment. And uh, he mentioned a bit then uh, not having trust anymore in institution, which is completely understandable because due to our economic growth, we are losing this trust. But we've been lucky enough, well, to have a lot of partners and some are institutions that actually supported us. So basically, I see that the sharing economy has a need to be a public service in many cases. So that's how we got our support, choosing to be not-for-profit. I think one of the challenges that we all face, everybody sitting here on this panel, is that we're all trying to create a two-sided marketplace, which is what the sharing economy model is about. So you've got to create the supply and the demand. And so if you compare that to, say, a, a, you know, a, a traditional business, let's say you open a coffee shop down the road, you've already got the supply of customers walking past your shop. It's just a question of whether there's a demand for what you're, you're serving. Whereas we're all sort of pioneering sort of um, new models in, in many cases where you've got to 
educate the suppliers and get the demand. And getting that balance is, is a real challenge. And Airbnb had exactly the same, you know, exactly the same problem. And it's chicken and egg. Do you get the, you've got to have the supply before you've, you, you start generating demand. But the suppliers, you get the suppliers and there's no demand. They, they, they have a bad user experience, so abandon the platform. So yeah. that's one of the biggest challenges, I think, this, this kind of sharing economy business. I'd, I'd agree with that, and I really liked um, Deb's point actually. You know, around how you have to educate the public. So that's that supply and demand. So it's educating on your your key points of difference, your KPDs, making sure that you've set that in place. Um, I don't know. I mean, I really love what we do, so I kind of find it quite funky and really enjoyable. But I think the hardest thing is sticking it out through the first year, you know, where there's a lot of excited highs and also where you are looking at stability because you know that you're meeting a need, but you're also wanting to do this in an ethical and viable way. So you probably have before you four sharing economy businesses that are doing this in a very ethical and viable way. And as Deb said, there are some businesses that go out there because there's a quick dollar to be made. So when you're going to do things in an ethical and viable way and you're doing it for the long term and especially in the kind of products that we work in because we have high-end elite athletes, we have trainers and we also have the online user experiences, you know, it was really important for us to make sure that we built trust. So I think Y1, which is what we all call as entrepreneurs Y1 the first year, um, can I speak unanimously, is probably the most challenging, where you're navigating, you're excited, but you're also going out there and you're working doubly hard to create that supply and demand market. We have probably time for one or two more quick questions. Um, so Tazar on Twitter asks, um, how can you trust when uh, people game the reviews, which has been observed on some platforms? Okay. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> it goes on. It's disgusting what I've seen. Um, yeah, with uh, so we there's a competitor out there now who has uh, false testimonies on their homepage um, and false reviews, and um, uh, in order to gain traction as well, um, they did a whole ton of reviews and they've got their system set so that uh, if you're a pet owner and you have a pet stay and the pet stay finishes and you don't make any review, like it reminds you and say you're out shopping at the time and you don't make a review, their system will automatically post a five-star review on your behalf, which is illegal and against um, C standards and international review standards, so it goes on. And what can you do? That's a challenge as a business um, that we have to face. And um, I don't think it's right, but on the other side of the table, I've uh, also raised this with investors, and you get all types of investors out there as well. And uh, I, I told one investor, and they said, well, is it getting them traction? And I said, yes. And he goes, what does it matter? And uh, I just thought, yeah, it matters because they're making up that this person is safe to put your pet with and someone is trusting a member of their furry family with possibly a complete loser who wouldn't know the first thing about looking after someone's pet. And, yeah, all in the name of revenue. But, uh, all right, I imagine it, there is a risk for fake reviews and stuff, but is it not that what marketing has been doing for the last 50 years, having <laughs> nice models in a bikini and thinking that we're all going to fit in it? So it's like the same line things. I know my dog Spot definitely prefers an owner wearing a bikini and model. Um, okay, we're, we're almost out of time, but we have one more question for Sabrina, and I think this is the, really the question on everybody's lips, which is, will the tool library have sewing machines? So, we are seeking one, so if someone here wants to donate, but on the other side, the Edge has a maker space downstairs that is public, is free, and everyone can just come in and use them, and they have 11 of them, so... Just to use the public service that is out there that you're paying with your taxes. 
<laughs> Great moment to finish. Could, ladies and gentlemen, could you please join me in thanking our fantastic panel tonight, Rob, Deb, Graziella and Sabrina. Thank you so much for your input this evening. See you all next month. <laughs>